Good morning. This is John Howard, Interim Chair of the Public Service Commission. I call this session of the Public Service Commission to order. Secretary Phillips, are there any changes to our final agenda? There are no changes to the agenda. Thank you. Before we get started, I'd like to note our arrangements for session today. In line with the guidance concerning social distancing and minimizing large gatherings, and in light of the executive orders that suspended provisions of the open meetings law on an emergency basis, we are conducting today's session remotely. I would like to remind those who are participating by phone that they please mute their lines except when they are speaking. The public will have an opportunity to listen to the session today on the department's webcast page. It will also record and transcribe the session as been our practice. These arrangements have been reviewed by our general counsel. He has found that these meet the requirements of the executive orders. I would like to conduct a roll call of our commissioners. Please confirm that you're with us when I call your name. Commissioner Diane Berman. Here. Commissioner James Alessi. I am here. Commissioner Tracy Edwards. I am here. Uh, before we begin today's session, I beg my fellow commissioners indulgence for a moment. When I joined the commission 20 minutes ago, I didn't imagine that one day I would become chair. I'm truly humbled and honored with this interim appointment. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my predecessor, John Rhodes, for his wisdom and leadership. We all will miss him very much. The issues that come before us affect the lives of all New Yorkers, and the role of the PSC has never been more critical. From decarbonizing our energy systems to overseeing the continually evolving telecommunications industry, the challenges ahead of us are to say the least daunting. But that being said, I truly believe that this commission and the women and men of the Department of Public Service are more than capable of handling this enormous task. I wanna thank my fellow commissioners and the DPS staff for their patience and generosity as I've transitioned to the role of chair. I wanna assure everyone that I will put my all into this position. Now let's begin today's session. Our first item for discussion is item 301, case 18T0604, which is an application of the Deepwater Wind South Fork LLC for a certificate of environmental compatibility and public need, and will be presented today by Administrative Law Judge Anthony Belesto. Judge Belesto, please begin. Good Good morning. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, Commissioners. This proceeding involves an application submitted pursuant to Article 7 of the Public Service Law by Deep Water Wind South Fork LLC for authorization to construct a transmission facility to connect the proposed South Fork wind farm located in federal waters to the existing mainland electric grid in the town of East Hampton. The project under consideration would consist of approximately 3.5 miles of submarine export cable from the New York State territorial water, waters boundary to the south shore of the town of East Hampton in Suffolk County, and approximately 4.1 miles of 138 kilovolt terrestrial export cable from the south shore of the town of East Hampton to an interconnection facility with an interconnection cable connecting to an existing East Hampton substation. It should be noted, but this project is the first to connect an offshore wind generation facility to New York State's electric system. The application was submitted on September 14, 2018 and was determined complete as of March 15, 2019. Public statement hearings were held in East Hampton on June 11, 2019. The public statement hearings were very well attended and included approximately 80 speakers. All persons wishing to make a statement were given an opportunity to do so. In addition, Nearly 3,000 written comments have been submitted in this proceeding. On September 17, 2020, the applicant filed a joint proposal, which was signed by the applicant, the Department of Public Service staff, the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, the Department of State, the Department of Transportation, the trustees of the freeholders and commonality of the town of East Hampton, Peace Egg, Long Island, local groups, 
Concerned Citizens of Montauk, the Group for the East End Incorporated, Montauk United, Win With Wind, and individuals Deborah Foster, Michael Hansen, and Kathy Rogers. The joint proposal is opposed by the Citizens for the Preservation of Wayne Scott, the Long Island Commercial Fishing Association, as well as a few individual local residents. The joint proposal represents a comprehensive settlement that is sufficiently supported by a record that will allow the commission to make all required findings. Article seven, required findings include among other things, the basis of the need for the facility, the nature of the probable impacts and that the facility avoids or minimizes to the extent practicable adverse environmental impacts considering the state of technology and the nature and economics of the various alternatives and that the facility conforms to a long range plan for expansion of the electric power grid of the state and interconnected systems. In this proceeding, the parties that oppose the joint proposal argue that the project is not needed or that it does not appropriately avoid or minimize environmental impacts, including impacts to commercial fishers. However, as described in detail in the draft order, the record fully supports a finding that the facility is necessary to transmit electricity from the proposed offshore South Fork Wind Farm Generation Facility to the point of interconnection at the East Hampton substation to meet the need identified by the Long Island Power Authority and its 2015 request for proposals regarding the energy needs of the South Fork of Long Island. The project will also help LIPA and the state achieve their renewable energy goals. Further, the record clearly supports the required findings, including that the facility avoids or minimizes any significant adverse impacts to the environment and active farming operations to the extent practicable and that the facility conforms to a long range plan for expansion of the electric power grid of the state. There are 195 proposed certificate conditions covering many different categories, including public health and safety, noise modeling and monitoring, a fisheries compensation plan, and minimums for cable burial depth, including a 30 foot minimum below the surface of Wayne Scott Beach, where the project is proposed to make landfall. The proposed certificate conditions limit construction periods to off-peak seasons to help ensure construction-related impacts are minimized. Further, the proposed certificate conditions require that during construction, access to Wayne Scott Beach, a long beach lane, be maintained, except for a few hours on a single day, if necessary, to deliver the sea to shore transition bolt. Various alternatives were raised during the proceeding, including those discussed in the application and those presented by interveners. Nothing in the record supports disrupting the joint proposal in favor of any of the alternatives. Based on the record, the proposed alternatives are either likely not viable due to the inability to obtain necessary property rights or will increase overall impacts relative to the project as proposed in the joint proposal. Therefore, the draft order recommends that the commission grant to the applicant pursuant to public service law, article seven, section 121, a conditional certificate of environmental compatibility and public need. And I'm happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, this order marks a milestone, as the judge said, in New York's bold initiative to decarbonize its electric grid through the development of offshore wind resources. While we have years of work ahead of us, today's approval of deep water wind South Fork's Article 7 application moves New York closer to its goal. As with every Article 7 case before the Commission, we strive to strike the proper balance between the public need and environmental compatibility. I believe this application meets the test. In the coming months and years, more cases like this will become before this Commission, and I trust they too will receive the same level of oversight that this case has received. I'll ask my fellow commissioners if they have any comments or questions. Commissioner Berman. I have none. Thank you so much. Commissioner Alisi. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, I am going to support this. Uh, I believe it is uh, necessary. Uh, a number of parties have come together uh, to support the enabling of connecting this export cable. Uh, it is also a reasonable approach uh, that protects the public interests. 
and uh, lessens any prospect of uh, negative impact as much as possible and uh, taking into account the understanding, understandable opposition uh, to this, uh, I am going to support it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. I think that this is a very important first step. Uh, there are difficulties that lie ahead. Uh, I think that we all knew that. However, we must take these steps forward uh, for our future, and I will be supporting this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Now I'll call for a vote on item 301. I will be voting in favor of this recommendation to adopt the terms of the joint proposal as we have discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? I will be concurring. Commissioner Alisi. I vote yes. Commissioner Edwards. I vote yes. This item is approved and the recommendation is adopted. We'll now move to our second item for discussion. Item 302, case 07E-0088 and 05E-1180 as they relate to the installed reserve margin presented by Leka Jonai, Chief of Electric Safety and Reliability, and Cynthia McCarran, Deputy Director, Safety and Reliability. Tammy Mitchell, Director of the Office of Electric, Gas, and Water is available for questions. Uh, Leka, will you please begin? Sure. Uh, good morning, Chair Howard and Commissioners. Um, as Chair Howard mentioned, my name is Leka Jonai, and I'm the Chief of the Department's Electric Safety and Reliability Section in the Office of Electric, Gas, and Water. Um, I'm here today to discuss item 302, which is an order confirming the one commissioner order issued on February 23rd that adopted the New York State Reliability Council's minimum installed reserve margin or IRM determination of 20.7% applicable to the 2021 electric capability year, which, is, which spans from May 1st, 2021 through April 30th, 2022. Um, before we get started with the slides and whatnot, I just wanted to head off any confusion as we move along. Um, if I refer to capacity resource or electric capacity or generation capacity, those terms are all referring to the same basic thing and are used interchangeably. Similarly, the terms load, customer demand, and customer, dem customer demands also refer to the same thing and are also used interchangeably. Uh, next slide, please. Can I go to slide two, please? Thank you. Um, the New York State Reliability Council, or Reliability Council, was formed in 1998 as part of the restructuring of New York's wholesale electricity market to promote and preserve the reliability of, the, of New York's bulk power system. Its reliability rules regarding the bulk electric system are binding on all New York market participants. This commission, by order dated February 9, 2006, formally adopted the Reliability Council's reliability rules in part to remove any doubt of their applicability. A key responsibility of the Reliability Council is determining the annual installed reserve margin or IRM for New York. Arithmetically and mathematically, the IRM represents the minimum, percent, minimum percentage above the peak forecast of demand that must be procured by load serving entities for their customers from qualified capacity resources. I underscore the word must because this is not an option or um, you know, a, a nice to have. You have to absolutely procure this amount. So for example, with this year's 20.7% install reserve margin, if you happen to be a load serving entity that has 1,000 megawatts of peak forecast load, you need to procure 1,207 megawatts for the capability period coming up. Uh, next slide, please. The fundamental purpose of the IRM is to ensure that adequate levels of electric capacity are available to reliably serve peak electric demands and available during system emergency conditions. Um, if one could perfectly predict future customer demands and if perfect capacity resources existed, there wouldn't be a need for an IRM, but that's not the, that's not the real world we live in. 
all load serving entities are required to demonstrate they've obtained sufficient installed reserves capacity either through the New York Indep Independent System Operators installed capacity markets or via a bilateral contract or via self-supply. In order to sell installed capacity in the, in the New York ISO markets, a capacity resource must be qualified by NISO and abide by its market participation rules and testing requirements. Unless a capacity resource is on a planned or forced repair outage, it must, again, I underscore that, be available and participate in NISO's daily energy market by offering in the day ahead energy market. In New York, for this obligation to serve, qualified capacity resources receive a separate capacity payment above and beyond energy market revenues they may, they may receive from the markets. Uh, next slide, please. In establishing the IRM, the reliability considers various factors, including load, load characteristics, uncertainties in load forecasts, generation outages and deratings, generation retirement, modeling of energy limited resources, demand response resources, interconnections with other control areas, and transfer capabilities within the New York State transmission system. All of the above data is used, I'm sorry, is used as input to a highly sophisticated probabilistic based computer simulation software, GE Mars, provided by General Electric. And given all the above considerations, an IRM of 20.7% was approved by the New York State Reliability Council's Executive Committee on December 4th, 2020 for the 2021 capability year, uh, May 1st, 2021 through April 30th, 2022. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of what this means for New York, the, the peak load in New York this summer is forecast to be 32,000 243 megawatts. Therefore, 20.7 IRM means that New York is required to have, a, at a minimum, 38,917 megawatts of installed capacity available. The 20.7 IRM for the, for the 2021 through 2022 capability year represents a 1.8% increase from the 2020 2021 IRM of 18.9%. The previous year's IRM was 18.9%. This 1.8% increase is due primarily to updated load forecast uncertainty and the modeling, and the more refined modeling, I should say, of energy limited resources, which include pump storage facilities. Next slide, please. Last. Um, while the 20.7 IRM is applicable statewide, there are three areas in New York that have local location installed capacity requirements, namely New York City, Zone J, Long Island, Zone K, and what's referred to as Lower Hudson Valley, Zone, Lower Hudson Valley Zones G through J. The need for these local requirements stems from the limitation of the electric transmission system and the large localized custom demands in these locations. The New York ISO, through a separate process using the IRM, calculates these minimum location requirements that are also mandatory. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just a table to sort of show, you know, how the IRM has varied through the years and just the last 10 years worth of data. And if you look at column three, the third column, I should say. The approved IRM has sort of ranged from 16% through now 20.7%, which is, seems is the highest level in the last 10 years. And that's a range of just under um, 5%. And however, what I wanted to point out with this table as well is that if you, if you go to the sixth column that says the actual IRM in percent, that actually represents the actual so-called, so to speak, iron in the ground that was available during those, during those years. In other words, this simply illustrates that, at least over the last 10 years and even prior to that, 
New York's IRM, the actual installed IRM, has actually been above the minimum, the minimum calculated by the New York State Liability Council. And the, the last three columns on this table highlight the um, significant amount of local locational requirements that exist across the state. As I mentioned earlier, there's only J, K, and, and G, through, um, G through J. So for example, if you look at the year 2021, um, for New York City, 80.3% of the peak forecast demand in New York City in, uh, is a requirement of having installed capacity at that level, 80.3% 80, 80 of its peak load, which is, these are not insignificant values here. Um, Chair Howard and Commissioners, that completes my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Leka. Um, reliability of our state's electric energy systems. Well, oh, excuse me, I want to turn it over to Cindy McCarran, pardon me. Okay. Um. Good morning, Cindy? Chair Howard and Commissioners. Um, at this time, we would like to supplement what Leka just told you by taking an opportunity to remind folks of the other steps we take to ensure reliability of the natural gas system and how that in turn benefits the reliability of the electric system. Because of the importance of the state's natural gas distribution system, not only for space and water heating during our cold winters, but also as fuel for electric generation, DPS staff take several measures to ensure its reliability. It should be noted that a significant amount of electric generation that runs on natural gas is connected to the state's local distribution companies or LDCs. Another group of generators is directly connected to the interstate pipelines that bring natural gas from the production areas to our LDCs. Starting in May every year, DPS staff review the preparedness of the LDCs for the coming winter, which culminates in a presentation at the October session to the PSC. This review includes an examination of extreme weather used for planning purposes and the mix of assets which will be used to provide service. The commission has instituted policies which require not only that our LDCs procure gas supply from a diverse portfolio of providers, including sourcing gas from different geographic areas through contracts of short and longer term duration, but also requires that the gas utilities pursue hedging, which limits the exposure of vulnerable customers to unanticipated price swings in the natural gas markets which occur largely during extreme weather events. These hedging mechanisms include the physical storage of natural gas during periods of low demand, as well as fixed price contracts and the use of financial options that limit exposure to price swings. These options are not speculative, but instead provide an insurance policy that guarantees lower prices in case of price spikes. The PSC has also ta taken steps to ensure that energy service companies that sell natural gas and electricity to retail customers don't charge more than the state's utilities would charge similar customers. Although many of the state's electric generators rely on interruptible natural gas, they also employ alternate fuel in many cases, so that in those limited instances where natural gas demand is high due to cold weather, they still can meet electric demand, which is lower in the winter anyway than in the summer due to air conditioning in the summer. DPS staff monitors the operations of our LDCs very closely, auditing records and observing field activities. Through our agency agreement with the Federal Department of Transportation's Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, or PHMSA, 
We also assist in auditing the operations and maintenance of the interstate pipeline. We also inspect their construction projects, checking on the qualifications of people they employ, as well as ensuring they are observing regulations. Finally, and most importantly, DPS staff maintains communications with participants in the state's energy markets through mechanisms like the Natural Gas Reliability Advisory Group and contact with organizations like the Northeast Gas Association. Staff also participates in industry meetings through the National Association of Pipeline Safety Regulators, known as NAPSER, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissions, or NARUC, and FIMSA, which allows us to have input into influencing national direction and discussions on safety and reliability topics. Frequent and open dialogue with the energy industry and other regulatory bodies at the state and federal level ensures a flow of information that contributes to system reliability. While no system is foolproof that depends on human beings, DPS staff take all reasonable steps under the guidance of the commission to ensure the reliability of our gas and electric systems. Um, that concludes my comments, and like Lekka, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Cindy. Um, we'll try again. Uh, reliability of our state's electric energy, uh, our state's energy systems, is the primary mission of this commission. This annual item is an integral part of that effort. This commission has aggressively pursued penalties and improvements through our experiences with natural disasters, storms, winter, and summer. However, this item deals with the fundamental operation of our entire electric grid. Failure of the grid has much more, and I would say existential consequences. As we decarbonize our energy systems, the foremost responsibility of this commission going forward is to ensure our electric grid maintains its reliability at the highest possible standards. I believe this is a truly moral obligation. With that, I would turn to our, my other commissioners for comments or questions. Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, Lekka and Cindy who um, really laid out um, the critical issues here. Uh, I will be voting in favor of this item. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank the New York State Reliability Council, the New York ISO, and other stakeholders that have been engaged in uh, working through the challenges um, that are before them. Um, the, as Lekka stated, the New York State Reliability Council is really um, its prime responsibility is determining the annual install reserve margin for New York and looking through about um, res the promoting and preserving the reliability of New York's power system. It takes an incredible amount of work, uh, technical resources and uh, analysis of important studies and information. The New York State Reliability Council did note that the three primary drivers of this increase includes one, updated low forecast uncertainty, two, representation of limited output of certain energy limited resources, and three, the retirement of certain generation coupled with topology changes. Uh, I really um, am mindful looking especially at the data on the historical uh, capacity data where the approved IRM, um, we went back uh, 10 years and the approved IRM has um, uh, not been over 20. I believe if uh, memory serves me, if we went back further, we would uh, see it's probably about 20 years old together um, from the last time there was an approved IRM over 20. As we move forward with clean energy initiatives in New York State, this is going to lead to um, the thousand of megawatts of additional generation in front of the meter, uh, uh, solar, PV, onshore wind, offshore wind, and other renewables. 
this impact of these high intermittent renewable resources on the installed reserve margin is something that we need to seriously consider and look at. Um, so I, I thank you and um, I appreciate the good work that everyone has been doing on this. I can't underscore enough the importance of reliability and the importance of the New York State Reliability Council who um, does incredible work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Alisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Yes, this has been recommended after a thorough study of various modeling results uh, critical to the health, safety, and welfare of the people of New York. Uh, it is reasonable. It addresses the state's needs as well as uh, state mandates to ensure adequate and reliable electric and understandably, as was pointed out, uh, this morning, it works in concert with reliable gas efforts as well. I will be supporting it. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Uh, yes, I will also be supporting this moving forward. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a complex issue, uh, but it is a critical one, and, uh, and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Um, now I'll call for a vote on this. Item. My vote is in favor of the recommendation to confirm the order adopting the installed reserve margin for the 21-22 capacity year as discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Alisi, how do you vote? I vote yes. Commissioner Edwards. I vote yes. Thank you. This item is approved. And the recommendation is adopted. Uh, we'll now move to our third item of discussion. Uh, item 501, case 21-M-0042, as it relates to the staff's investigation of the impact of Tropical Storm ICAS on the telephone and cable television services presented by Joseph Such, Director of Office of Investigation and Enforcement. Michael Rowley, Chief of Network Reliability, and Deborah LaBelle, Director of the Office of Telecommunications, and Brian Oasius, uh, Managing Attorney, will be available for comments. And Joe, would you please begin? Good morning, Chair Howard and Commissioners. Item, item 501 is a draft order adopting terms of settlement between the department and telecommunications company Altice USA regarding its performance during the August 4th 2020 Tropical Storm ICAS. As you may remember, on August 4, 2020, Tropical Storm ICAS made landfall across New York, including Altice's service territory. The storm resulted in widespread damage to the state's electrical and telecommunications infrastructure. More than 400,000 customers served by Altice's New York affiliate Optimum lost service, which took the company 14 days to fully restore. On August 5, 2020, the day after ICAS hit New York, Governor Cuomo directed the department to conduct a thorough investigation of New York's telecommunications and electric utility companies' preparation for and response to ICAS. On August 19, 2020, the department, based on its initial findings and observations, issued Altice a Notice of Apparent Violations, or NOAV. The NOAV identified apparent violations of the Public Service Law, Altice's Resiliency Plan, or RP, and its Severe Weather Prevention Plan, or SWPP, relating to, one, network planning, two, customer service and communications, and three, government coordination. For clarity, the RP and the SWPP were required and made enforceable by the Commission's 2016 order approving the transfer of assets from Cablevision to Altice. The NOEV also required Altice to immediately implement a series of remedial actions, including additional storm crewing, to mitigate the then existing public health and safety crisis resulting from the company's poor storm performance and to prevent any similar future delays. The day after the NOAV was issued, the department began the second phase of its investigation. The second phase, conducted with the support 
from the Department of Financial Services and its extensive forensic team include a review of customer, municipal, and county complaints, letters, reports, and comments, meeting with municipal officials, reviewing over 95,000 pages of Altice emails and documents, and interviewing nine senior-level Altice employees with storm responsibilities. Rather than litigating the matter, Altice notified the department early in our investigation process that Altice intended to fully cooperate and remediate the alleged violations. Altice also hired outside legal counsel to conduct an internal investigation of its review of its storm performance. On October 1, 2020, Altice made a full disclosure of its investigation findings and the root causes of its inadequate performance during ICA. The results of the department's investigation, as do Altice and other telecommunication companies, were provided to the commission on February 11, 2021 in a report entitled, Investigation Report on Tropical Storm ICAs, Impact on Telephone and Cable Television Networks and Services. As to Altice, this report revealed that the company failed to adhere to many significant aspects of its RP and SWPP. Specifically, Altice did not provide accurate outage and restoration information to the department and municipal officials, particularly in Westchester, Nassau, and Suffolk counties. The department also identified, and Altice acknowledged, several problems with its interactive voice response system, or IVR, and its website that prevented customers from lodging service requests. Altice also did not conduct any pre-storm municipal, county, and electric utility outreach, which could have resulted in a more coordinated and timely restoration effort. The report also recommended modifications to the Commission's telephone and cable regulations to better address credits and storm response. After initial exploratory settlement discussions, Altice filed a no Notice of Impending Settlement, or NOIF, with the Secretary on February 17, 2021. On March 11, 2021, the Department and Altice signed a circa $72 million settlement agreement to resolve Altice's alleged violations relating to the preparation for and response to Tropical Storm ICAs. The draft order before you adopts the terms of the settlement agreement. In short, the agreement requires Altice to complete an estimated $68.54 million and post ICA's capital and operational storm-related remedial measures over a two-year period. As detailed in the settlement agreement, these remedial measures include a new state-of-the-art outage communication platform, additional call center personnel and upgrades, the hiring of six additional storm recovery and municipal service coordinators, a new full-time storm remediation coordinator, upgrades to its customer care-related infrastructure and technology, and the addition of restoration crews. Altice has completed, or is in the process of completing, many of these measures already. The remedial measures directly address the department's investigation findings and the concerns of Altice's customers. In addition to the above $68.54 million, Altice has paid $3.4 $3.4 million in credits to its customers relating to ICAS outages. None of this nearly $72 million in total cost to the company will be borne by Altice's New York customers. Further, Altice is committed to a series of training, procedural, and administrative improvements to its STORM program. The department believes the settlement agreement is consistent with the commission settlement guidelines is in the public interest and importantly, further serves as an industry-wide deterrent for any similar future storm performance. The department therefore recommends the adoption of the draft order by the commission. Thank you for your consideration and the settlement team is available for questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Um, I, I truly want to congratulate staff for their prompt and comprehensive work on this item. And I must give credit to the wisdom of prior commissions whose orders in agreeing to the Altice takeover of Cablevision and its affiliates, which allowed 
this full blown settlement to occur in its great detail through the provisions uh, of that original uh, approval. However, despite the commission's wisdom and past orders to make this possible, I would again a call on the members of Congress to grant all states the ability to fully regulate data services as utility services as we now know, we all know how dependent we are on data and internet services for many and or not most of our modern society. With that, uh, I would ask my fellow commissioners for comments. Uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, I do wanna thank staff for their hard work here. I think this is a good settlement. Um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that there's a linkage to the settlement funds that are tied to the issue at hand. There was a focus of working in a cooperative fashion with the company and looking at the self-disclosures, remediation, uh, how to enforce, and this path forward. And I appreciate that. Uh, and it also following the settlement guidelines. With all of that, um, I will be voting in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Alisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to support this. Uh, I think that the company, after uh, many failures, uh, very quickly turned things around and uh, began to address the shortcomings and uh, uh, strive for uh, better practices. Uh, this agreement uh, protects the consumer. Uh, it's fair to investors, and it assures the viability of the utility itself. Uh, it's a reasonable result that might have come easily from a long and arduous uh, litigation. Uh, I believe it's a great job uh, by all parties involved. I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. Yeah, I will be supporting this as well. I um, I really think that the staff has moved really swiftly and comprehensively on this, and we need to continue to do that. Uh, you know, storms are extremely tough for all consumers, but the lack of communication or miscommunication is just totally unacceptable. Uh, so I want to thank you for drilling down into this, and I encourage uh, all of us to continue to do this as quickly as we can. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll now call for a vote. I will be voting in favor of the recommendation to adopt the terms of the settlement agreement as discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Alisi. I vote yes. Commissioner Edwards. I vote yes. Thank you. This item is approved and adopted. Uh, we will now move to the consent agenda. Do any commissioners wish to comment or accuse them from voting on any items of the consent agenda. We'll begin with Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. I do have several items that I will be speaking on um, relatively quickly. On item 162, this um, is where the company is proposing to modify its emergency electric generator provisions in its gas tariff. Um, in January 2019, the company declared a temporary moratorium for part of its service territory in Westchester County due to an inability to obtain sufficient pipeline capacity to meet peak gas demand. As a result, new gas connections and requests for additional load to an existing service were suspended. By this proposal to modify its emergency electric generator provisions, um, it, it helps to try to reduce the cost burden to affected customers uh, within that gas moratorium issue uh, area. This is one of the many challenges related to the continued moratorium. I su support um, this effort and I appreciate the company bringing this forward. It is something that we need to be mindful of uh, as we move forward on other uh, issues and challenges. The next item is item 164.
here this is um, an item that uh, is essentially asking Corning to explain why PPP loans that they um, uh, may have and may be seeking um, don't um, uh, don't set up a double recovery of the company's operating it costs. Staff is recommending that the commission require them to respond to specific questions related to its federal COVID-19 loan and to formally explain in detail why receipt of the PPP funds does not provide double recovery of the company's operating costs, first through existing rates and then through the receipt of the conversion of the PPP loan to a grant, and therefore why the PPP funds should not be preserved for ratepayer benefits. I am concurring with this, but I do want to note that it's really important for us to be mindful of the fact that the federal PPP loans are somewhat confusing. We do want to encourage companies who are able to take advantage of it to do so, and we need to be mindful of looking holistically at all of the things for um, uh, what the intended uh, effect is, as well as ensuring that we are not overstepping on um, the federal PPP loan requirements. This is something that I think that can be taken care of uh, to uh, in um, a rate case. And so it is something that I am mindful that I don't want us to be, um, I want us to work in a collaborative fashion with Corning. They did put in um, back um, in the spring of 2020, a letter that was uh, explaining what they were doing. I would encourage staff and the company to continue working in a way that enables um, good forward progress. I will point out that 164 is different from 562. It is also essentially asking um, those companies those uh, to uh, explain why their PP loans um, uh, are not a double recovery. The difference between 562 and 164 is in 562, those companies would not necessarily be coming um, uh, before us for a rate case. So we do need to put them on notice. Um, across the board, I think it's, for me, it's quite simple. It's on notice that we will be looking at these things. It's important to ensure the prudent expenditure of uh, funds uh, and, um, and making sure that we're doing all we can to help um, uh, the customers. So that's on 164, which I will be concurring. On 165, just give me a moment, I'm just gonna pull up my information. Item 165 is the um, settlement with the company for violations stemming from operator qualifications, testing, and cathodic protection concerns. First, I wanna commend the staff uh, for their excellent work in investigating these serious matters and obtaining a good enforcement result in terms of a dollar amount. The underlying issue of ensuring that the workforce entrusted to work on gas pipelines is adequately trained is a very serious matter. It's a crucial time for us to be involved with pipeline safety. Operator qualifications and other safety and training requirements must be vigorously adhered to. The settlement implicitly recognizes the ongoing good work with several stakeholders, including NGA, um, several New York companies, um, as well as GTI and um, our staff, looking at compliance with API 1173 guidance and adhering to sound cathodic protection measures. API 1173, which is Pipeline Safety Management System, is a recommended holistic voluntary practice um, that the NTSB, PHMSA, and others has shown tremendous support for. It establishes a pipeline safety management system framework that when properly applied can provide an opportunity to help reveal and manage risk, promote a learning environment, if necessary, enact any changing changes and improvements such that the focus is continuously improving pipeline safety and integrity, 
And ultimately, this supports a drive towards a zero incident mindset by ensuring that the various components of the safety management system are regularly reviewed and continually evolving. I'm very supportive and, uh, of gas safety improvements and encourage folks to continue to work on that. In fact, uh, item 167 is an excellent example of just the very thing that we should be doing. Uh, it's a model for how to work with various stakeholders on different uh, gas safety um, issues and how to encourage um, thoughtfulness uh, and continue to engage so that we could all be moving towards um, um, better uh, continuous improvement with gas safety. So this is all good. However, my grave concern is that we at the commission through this settlement as to the monetary fund allocation miss an important opportunity to do more to affirmatively advance and support gas safety efforts. Here, we directed the funds to be used as a credit to offset the company's energy efficiency and demand response program. And we leave it to the ongoing rate case to work out the specifics on the use of those restitution funds. I understand the legal requirement under 25A is to direct any penalty funds from shareholders for the benefit of ratepayers. This settlement on its face is or can be argued as consistent with that minimum standard. However, I strongly believe we must go further as we have in the past by directing settlement funds like these in a matter that has more direct nexus to a, the alleged violations. In past cases, we have directed settlement funds for projects that would make similar alleged violations less likely in the future, or that would more directly address the harm associated with the alleged violation. The LT settlement we just voted on that we approved today is a good example of that approach. There is a direct linkage to the funds and the um, issues at hand. Here there is none. For these reasons, I must vote no on this item. <clears throat> Next. 371, I will be concurring with reservation. I generally am supportive. However, I do point out that here, in especially we have a footnote 14 that says the commission may modify these arrangements in a future order acting on the cost sharing 2.0 proposal. I don't believe this interim solution is giving us the regulatory certainty and more importantly, giving the regulatory certainty to those folks who need to rely on it. There have been in the past concern when we have changed our regulations uh, and we need to be very mindful of what that means, but also in the fact that an interim solution may not be the impetus to actually help get us to a permanent solution because those who are involved in wanting the interim solution to remain may be locked into not looking at further uh, permanent solution if it's different from where they're currently comfortable. Therefore, I concur with reservation. 374, I concur. I don't have any comment on it. I do want to point out on uh, items 380 to 385, these are submetering items. There is new language in um, these orders that I think is worthy of being flagged. Um, it addresses the uh, important issue of clarifying Part 96 regula regulations and sets expectations for those existing Part 96 regulations. This is addressing the rate cap section in Part 96 that addresses that the rate cap shall be the rates and charges of the distribution utility for delivering commodity in that billing period. And this is important to similarly situated direct meter residential customers. I am very supportive of working through what we need to do to help customers who may qualify for low income energy affordability programs. So the language in the sub metering order does announce that low-income customers would receive the EAP credit if they were direct metered by the utility. Therefore, we're looking at the owner's rate cap calculation and how it should be factored in energy affordability program bill discounts. 
staff is doing a good thing in proposing to clarify the expected benefit to low-income customers in these orders. However, I am flagging it because there are going to be a lot of challenges and nuances in the implementation of that, as well as the expectations that are required and who is responsible for what. Coordination of how low-income customers are made aware of EAP bill discounts and the development of documentation for tenants to receive the EAP discounts will, I understand, be addressed in the second phase of the energy affordability proceeding. It's very important that we make sure there is good representation from the sub-metering community at all levels, um, tenants, um, uh, developers, um, uh, uh, owners, et cetera, so that we fully understand some of the challenges that are there and make sure that people understand what are in the existing regulations that we are now clarifying. With that, I have nothing further. Thank you so much. Commissioner Alisi. I have nothing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Uh, no, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Berman's words uh, today, especially on the issues of low income and sub metering. I appreciate those comments and uh, I will not have any further comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'll call for a vote on the consent agenda. My vote is in favor of uh, the re recommendations on the consent agenda. Commissioner Berman, could you articulate uh, your votes for the secretary, please? Sure. Um, I am voting in favor, except 162. I am concurring. 164, I am concurring. 165, I am a no. 371, I concur with reservation. 374, I concur. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Alisi? Thank you. I vote yes on all items. Thank you very much. Commissioner Edwards? I vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. These items are approved and adopted. Uh, Secretary Phillips, is there anything further to come before us today? Um, yes, uh, Chair, I'd like to ask for clarification on Commissioner Berman's vote regarding item 371. I noted that she con concurs with reservations, but I'd like to clarify, does that mean you do not fully agree with the result or that you do? Any time that I concur, yeah, I'm concurring based on the ultimate outcome, however, I'm, there may be underlying issues within the order itself, um, maybe the way it's written, et cetera, that I disagree. In this, I'm underscoring on 371 that I concur, but I do have reservation as it relates to the underlying result of an interim solution. Therefore, based on that, you can um, count me as concurring, but I am underscoring that it is based on my reservation with the interim solution, which ultimately leads to um, the actual result. Okay, and just to be absolutely certain then on the order it can say concur. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anything Sorry, further, Chair. Madam Secretary? There is one other thing that I believe you would like to address. Yes, um, today is a, a melancholy moment for us here at the commission where we honor the departure of one of the finest civil servants uh, I have ever met in my career, Doris Stout. And uh, to that end, I would like to read a resolution of the commission into the record. Um, this is a resolution of the Public Service Commission of the State of New York. Whereas Doris Stout has served the Department of Public Service, the Public Service Commission and the citizens of New York since 1989 with great distinction. And whereas Ms. Stout began her career in the department as a senior utility financial analyst on June 14, 1989, and has steadily increased her responsibilities through a series of well-earned promotions, culminating in her current leadership role as director of the Office of Audits, Accounting, and Finances. Whereas Ms. Stout has exemplified the role of the role public service. Of public 
taking great care to provide thoughtful and thorough analysis in every matter and always striving for the right decisions, no matter how hard, creating opportunities for her colleagues to learn and grow and conducting her work with the utmost integrity and professionalism. Whereas Ms. Stout has brought her extensive knowledge and invaluable guidance and patience to bear in an untold number of meetings, hearings, and commission sessions, to the great benefit of those who have the good fortune of working with her. And whereas Ms. Stout has generously shared her expertise with others in the department, the commission, and the National Association of Utility Regulatory Commissioners. Whereas Ms. Stout has worked tirelessly and served the administration in respect of the public service staff and the Public Service Commission. And whereas Ms. Stout will now have more time to spend with her husband, Warren, her dogs, Petra and Chloe, and her extended family and friends. It is resolved that New York State, the New York State Public Service Commission expresses its deepest appreciation of Doris Stout for her leadership in the department and her faithful service to its citizens of the state of New York, as demonstrated by her unwavering commitment to the mission of the commission to ensure safe, secure, reliable access to electric, gas, and steam, and telecommunications and water services for all of New York's residential and business customers. At this session, the Public Service Commission held March 18th, 2021 in the city of Albany. Um, you know, Doris, uh, you're a rare breed. A person who has decided to use her expertise and skill for the public interest, even though Someone with your skill, expertise, could have been far more compensated in the private sector, and you would have been an invaluable part of any investment bank. I am sure of that. However, you decided to make your career serving the people of the state of New York, and for that, we should all be grateful. Thank you so much, Doris. Do any of my fellow commissioners have a comment? Commissioner Berman? Thank you so much. Doris rose through the ranks at the Department of Public Service to become the first female director of accounting and finance. She learned from some of the best, including Charlie. Char Doris was always professional, always approachable, very, very smart, dedicated, and a team player. Doris gave me a book once authored by her sister-in-law shortly after Lynn passed away in April 2018, and it made a huge impact on me. I feel that Lynn would be really, really proud of how Doris embodies the essence of prudent, compassionate, economic regulatory thinking. Doris, Doris's quiet but steady focus on helping give us information on the financial impact from her policy actions even when it was difficult to do so, was most appreciated. Doris was a role model for me and so many others. Not only was she the first female director of accounting and finance, but she was the first female member of ANF's management team. She paved the way for others, as evidenced by the recent promotions of Allison Mann and Debbie Evans to acting chief positions, and they joined Denise as ANF's three chiefs. I am truly happy, Doris, for you and your husband, Warren, and I wish you many adventures doing what you both love, travel, kayaking, and playing with your dogs. Doris, I will greatly miss your presence at DPS, and thank you for making such a positive difference in my life. Thank you. Commissioner Lisi? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I guess it's uh, wherever you go, um, I hope that uh, it's a beautiful and wonderful place and whatever you do, uh, that you enjoy it thoroughly and fully. You certainly have earned it. And uh, I just hope all good things come your way as you enjoy your retirement. And thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Now, I just want to thank you, Doris, for your professionalism, your thoughtfulness. Uh, you really do everything in a way uh, that is comprehensive, uh, but you do it in a way with a lot of style and grace. And I truly wish you all the best wishes to you and your family. 
Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Uh, again, what a, we weren't all in the same place. <laughs> If I, if that, I may, I want to thank you all for your, I want to thank you all for your kind words. Um, I'm fortunate to have had a long and exciting career with this organization because we're accomplishing some really important things for the people of New York. Um, my success has only been as great as my team. I have a fantastic team in the Office of Accounting, Audits and Finance. And um, I'm comfortable retiring knowing I'm turning over the reins to this talented management team as well as the auditors and financial analysts and AANF. It's been a privilege and honor working with my colleagues here at the DPS. They're an incredible group of hardworking, knowledgeable, and talented individuals, and I will miss our camaraderie. So everybody take care of yourselves and uh, best wishes and thanks again. Thank you, Doris. Secretary Phillips, are, do we have anything else? There is nothing further. Thank you. Uh, well, then I will. Uh, call for the adjournment of this session of the New York State uh, Public Service Commission. Thank you.